Howdy, friends. This is Adam Ganser stopping by just to thank you so much for listening to us and all of our precious projects on the Small Beans Patreon. And if you have a couple extra bucks and haven't signed up for our $5 tier, I wanted to let you know there is some of the best entertainment anywhere on the internet just waiting for your listening pleasure. This includes episodes of I'll Show You Mine If You Show Me Yours, Spiel Boys, Star Trek The Next Futurama, and coming soon some very secret but very awesome projects we can't wait to show you. If you got the money and you feel like it, we'd sure love to have it. And thanks so much for listening to Small Beans. It's time for Dad's now. Look, it's all about dads. I don't want you talking about anything but dads. Cause it's all dads now. Yeah. It's inside dads. Oh, yeah, that's smooth. Smooth daddies. Yeah. It's like swallowing silk. Uh, I'm Abe Epperson. I'm joined with Dave Bell. Hello. Hello, everyone. Together, we are inside dads. We're getting right inside of them. Knuckle deep. The deal with this podcast is we talk about dad movies. That's correct, Abe. Russell Crowe's, Bruce Willis's, Kevin Costner's, Harrison Ford's, you know, dad Perhaps shit. a Michael Douglas. Perhaps a Michael Douglas. Mm. Yeah, we love dad movies. And you, you know what? The people listening, they also love dad movies. Yeah, we all love dad movies. Yeah. And I think that we are on a search. We think dad movies transcend genre. So we're looking at different genres of what we'd call a dad movie mm-hmm. and seeing what the unified kind of trends are. Because Hollywood clearly for decades has told us what it means to be a dad. And so we're going to kind of remove the veil a little bit and see what the nature of the Hollywood dad is. And what, 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 co- what does culture say it means yeah. to be a dad? And what is the ultimate dad film? And like, what is yeah. the defining traits for dad films? We've we've written down a lot, um, and I think we're, it's, I think in order to like you're saying to figure out the ultimate mm-hmm. traits, we have to really transcend genre. Which right. I would argue we're not quite doing this episode. I would argue this episode is to get everybody kind of get them toes back in the water get a good baseline we also want to talk about money dads because we've we've talked about jobs yeah like how 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 a how a dad is always like torn between family and job but like we needed a movie i think to really really show off the struggle of like unhinged dad without a family what is he gonna do he's gonna get in trouble He's going to do a Wall Street. He's going to do a Wall Street. Wall Street. Yeah, this is um I think I was thinking of this in terms of cuz we're going to we're going to soon spoilers get into horror films, dad horror films. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about what does it take to make a, a dad horror film? And one of the obvious ones that we're not doing is The Devil's Advocate. And I wanted right. to point that out because I think this movie is uh, a good companion to that. Because I would argue this Wall Street is a cautionary dad film the way The Devil's Advocate is. You know, the point of a horror movie is to scare you. So a dad horror movie would scare dads about dad things, right? Yeah. And I right. think financial crimes are the one of those like ultimate kind of dad film uh and cautionary genres whereas we covered heat where i think heist in crime films there's always this feeling of like well you got to respect the criminal though you know like there's this respect right. reverence financial crimes i don't think dads have that reverence or respect for because you know what dads hate losing money i mean everybody yeah. hates it but gotta, getting scammed yeah. out of money that's the ultimate crime you know mm-hmm this is also directed by Oliver Stone, who yep. I think, even though he's, it's the first film we've covered with him uh, as director, uh, just so you know who Oliver Stone is, he directed Platoon, JFK, Any Given Sunday, Alexander. He's also the writer of Scarface and Conan yeah. the Barbarian. 
that's a pretty dad. Uh, like yeah. that's up there in de- director dad uh, staples with James Mangold and like John yeah. Tiernan and stuff. Oliver Stone knows he knows how to get inside a dad. He knows yeah. the ins and out and outs of a in dad. In ins and outs, he knows this, what buttons to push to make dads really squeal. You yeah, know? this movie I would also argue is filled with dad actors um yes. future old dads and new like young dads like people like john c mcginley where i'm like that's a dad actor he's young mm-hmm. he doesn't even realize it and then right. you got like hal holbrook and martin sheen in there is like holbrook oh my is, god and terrence stamp dude yeah these he's are like he's just a actors. judgment judgmental grandpa right but then yeah. you got like you know good old chuck sheen um and like and and, uh, and so like he's he represents like yeah these are this is the young generation mm-hmm. meeting the old generation of dad actors and it has to be said that we literally have dads and sons playing dads and sons in this movie yep. Charlie Sheen uh the character and the man his father Martin Sheen plays Carl Fox yep to Charlie Sheen's Bud Fox. Bud also, Fox. Michael Douglas is Gordon Gecko. What's up with the What's up with the animals? Oh, oh yeah, oh, Gecko. It's, it's symbolism, Abe. I think it's symbolism. A Gecko. I, but, like, I actually. I don't know, it's funny. I didn't even notice the last names. I was obsessed with the first because I would argue, as we're going to get into, this is about a a. a a guy trying to find his daddy. His name is mm-hmm. Bud, the ultimate child name. Sport. Sport, Bud. And then his daddy is Gordon, the ultimate daddy name. So I Gordon was thinking is of... the dad name. Yeah, I was thinking it's like Gordon and Bud. I wasn't even... It, I completely <laughs> didn't notice the fox and gecko thing. The fox and gecko thing is just so... Because no. I think it's because they're so cool that they yeah. have X's in their name. And gecko is spelled G-E-K-K-O. Yeah. So it's like... I don't know. There's just something about like some letters bring that extreme aspect to it. X is the obvious one, but also like... If you have a choice over a C and a K, it's more extreme to go with the K. Well, yeah, because the K wrong? is almost an X. It's sharp. It's almost an X. That's right. We're it's just half tra- of an X. You are so smart. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Let's get it. I mean, we haven't officially said this, so let's get inside this dad. That's the name of the segment. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. But, but we're, we're going to come through the movie and identify what makes it dad. There's a few other general thoughts that I had. Kind of on your comment about Devil's Advocate. I think mentorship is an important dad is like important dad material. Oh right? yeah, dudes love mentorships, not just father son stories, which is like kind of the ba- like the the most uh, simple or like um, you know refined primary kind of archaic version of mentorship. Like that's what's supposed to happen between fathers and sons. But in a dad film, you almost always have. I mean, the hero story itself has that mentor characters, right? Like we're yeah. all familiar with the um the utility of people like Gandalf or, you know, what's his fucking name in the Harry Potters, the the Dumbledores. Yeah. You know, we always have this guy who kinda has to die in order for you to um Obi-Wan. become your true go from boy to man. Right. Um now that isn't dad movies. That's more of the hero's story. But like I think that it's important dad material emotionally because dudes love to de- like, especially if you have a dad and there's like a second dad that comes into play who's like, I'm going to teach you all about this other thing. That's what this movie is truly about. Yeah. Um, I have think you it's ever about- had a second dad? Um, like a professor or something? I've had people who tried to be and they, right. I, I rejected it because I didn't need one. So no, not really. I've never had like a mentor. I've had people that I like looked up to professionally and like, you know, thought about when I reached mm. certain levels in my career, but I've never had someone who was like, I'm going to put you under my wing. You know, have you? Uh, I, yeah, I had a film professor who was like, like he, he did the, he did the courtship thing too, which is kind of right. weird because like I wrote a paper and he gave me an A plus and he was like, see me after class. And then like his first question he asked me was like, what do you want to do with your life <laughs> and stuff like that? And I'm like, Ooh. my dad never asked me these questions. You're my new dad. New dad. 
And it makes sense that I turned into a filmmaker because of that, because I think that's what I'm trying to get at. The mentorship aspect, when it's working, there's reverence for that from oh, most dads. Right? I think that's what makes The Devil's Advocate and, again, this kind of a well, horror yeah. dad movie because it's twisting the idea of a mentorship, of, a pure right, thing right. that you have reverence for. What if mm-hmm. you have a bad mentor, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. This movie is all about, I think a big player in this movie and a, I think a, a very prominent dad movie villain is cocaine. The yeah, concept yeah. of cocaine, because here's the mm-hmm. thing about cocaine. It, it gives you time something that dads value you get more time if you're on cocaine but then you lose money something that dads don't like to lose and they it also um you know makes you dependent on something that's something dads also don't like so it's the the allure i think dads around the world are constantly tempted by cocaine and thinking about cocaine and wanting Mm -hmm. to do cocaine because it's like a magic dust that gives you more time but there's this again it's a cautionary thing and in the same way being a a big city lawyer or in this case a big city money wall street guy trader i don't know um, broker. has the, broker sure it has the cocaine allure which is that ooh mm-hmm. it gives you money and power but it's at the cost of the little guy and dads love the little guy so that's the right. ultimate it's the ultimate temptation it is yeah. the ring of power right it's the downfall of dads is cocaine yes cocaine and greed is like mm. yes we love money we want money uh and we, and want we love time. time. Yeah, there's something, there's got to be some arithmetic that you're, because time is money. So is cocaine. It, but like it's not, it, it's a, I think it's a net zero because cocaine it's costs net money, zero. but gives you more time. And that's and why if it's time bad. is money, then you end up where you be when, where you started, that, you know? That's right. There it is. Yeah. It, 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 it means it makes a net zero. So yeah. don't do cocaine because it's just going to, you're not going to be a hero. You're going to be a zero. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, I see that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely symbolic in this movie. It's not as much in like, as in Wolf of Wall Street where drugs play like a crazy role. This is like, right. he does it in a limo at one point. Um, but it's part of that. Channel. Flying high. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, let's kind of comb through some, some of the, um, specific scenes from yeah. starting from the beginning because I, I want to start with the talk credits. about how this sets it up first things first the int- the uh the the kind of credits it's new york city waking up it's fairly normal there's a lot of <laughs> shots of the world trade center yeah it's set uh, to a sinatra song and it says an oliver yep. stone film and i was like this is the it's most like, dad Jesus. things can yeah. get yeah and um i think that that's going to be an interesting thing there, I, I, mm, I let's talk about Charlie Sheen. He's got a walk and talk that intros him. He's in perpetual motion. He's in his element. Good at his job. Well liked. Key to building an every dad, right? Yeah, this and is I, all stuff we've talked about before. Well, I think when we talk about dad films, we often talk about like, like without knowing it, what is their what is their weapon? What is their strength? Right? If you watch a, a war movie, you know it's obviously their their. <clears throat> Gun leadership or gun. Yeah. Um, you watch a lawyer movie; it's their ability to convince people. In this, we got the lawyer movie thing. They're talking. It's a lot of talking. They're He's wise a guys. Yeah, yeah. It, it it's kind of it's Wall Street is the perfect combination, in my opinion, of like mob style wise guy crime people, sex, mm. drugs, and computers and gadgets and we'll get to that yeah Um, that's the thing that i kind of want to mention straight out in front the kind of elephant in the room um new york city and the concept of the city bustle is not typically a very typical dad thing it's we usually present in a lot of dad movies kind of a rural sentiment seeped in tradition. And there's loads of dad movies which directly combat modernism, even yes. though there's often a compromise at the end. So how does dad work when it's seen as like Wall Street, broker, that's a con man job. Well, that's I think, not a... Well, oh, I have ideas. Okay, uh, yeah. 
first off, in 1987, that public perception was probably less ubiquitous than it is now. But we often typically show elements of his personality as not married to the modern city. We see, in fact, that's just the temptation. He gets more, even though he's already like a city guy. Yeah, I mean, um, he only gets the limos later. So I mean, we see like Charlie Sheen with like he's getting beers with his blue collar dudes. Like they're all like, forget about it. You know? And, yeah, no, it's the lure of the city. It's the same as the judge, yeah, right? He's a right. big city lawyer. The big city blank is not seen as respectable, nor is it in this. But no, it is yeah. tempting, is what they're saying. There's the temptation of the There's big city life. Because we see in the opening kind of sequences that even though he is that guy, he's fast talking and he does the city beat, uh, he also checks in with his own father. Yeah. Uh, so he's a man who values family. At the Owl and that's just Tavern. Not, it, that's not really a prejudice we reserve for like account men or brokers, right? So he's atypical even in our perception of what we consider like his job. I yeah. just think it's interesting that like dad films do this. They take something that is like, okay, so what's the job and what are our preconceptions or prejudices about that job for the audience? Right. How do we combat that to make it more dad? It's almost like it's written in the DNA of a dad film. They do have to ensure that there's a way out of that problem well yeah you, because you know yeah our main character the idea is his soul can be saved again like the judge where when he goes home he can mm -hmm. talk the small town talk right he, yeah. he like so it's this idea of like he wears oh, his mega death shirt you know? his dad is a union man he fixes planes they he keeps saying ah you're a salesman to his son and he's yeah. like no dad i'm this and he's like a salesman's a salesman and so like that's the idea of like he is in danger of becoming the stuffed shirt that will screw over the working man that is on the line here. And it's showing that his dad, while accepting him, is sort of aware of that idea that right. he's getting lured yeah. into becoming just some stuffed shirt, uh, just some big city money man. And that's kind of what made me, that makes me realize that like, after all these movies about like doing the same maneuver, more or less, nothing trumps the underdog. You can have any yeah. job or be any type of person in these movies. As long as you're a bit down on your luck, like you live in a roach infested apartment, you'll always need money or whatever. Right. You are. That's that's almost all you need for dads to be like, oh, <laughs> you know, right. like that's, that's wanna, all we need sometimes. Yeah. No, he he's he he needs to belong. He needs money. And there's also I want to even go backwards to that opening scene in in the, his office and the allure that they represent, because there is a man in a funny nose glasses like a fucking mad magazine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bit. And, yeah, yeah. and that's like tits for dads. That's, that's some spice right there because they're, <laughs> they're, they're showing this room. That's like, look at all these it's cool. Like, dads. did you notice that like power is represented by how many computers there are? Um, yeah. And so like, they're showing, look at all these fucking that's computers. That's still true, dude. Yeah. How many monitors you have. Yeah. That's like how, how important you are. Look at these guys. They're all joking around. They're having fun. They have so many computers and they're talking. They're giving speeches on the phone. They're yeah. so good at fucking fancy talk and and so like even when we meet gordon uh, later he's talking on the phone that's the first thing he's the best talker he has the mm -hmm. most computers in his office and so it's showing like yeah there is there is something here he's you know this big city life with all these cool gadgets because dads love gadgets and all this cool talking and all this camaraderie um so like we're seeing this and then the tavern seeing those two sides right because dad's right. also like beer and being down to earth and talking about unions and shit yeah just talking about you know like talking about how we're kept down by the man yeah also you mentioned the kind of space something i noticed about these types of movies in production design or art direction is a lot of them portray like it's like how they portray a home base Often it's a workplace, could just be a literal home, though usually it isn't because it's not a lot of dad movies take place at the home, but um, it's lived in and it's often messy. I think dads aren't naturally clean, no. or at least I'm not. At least Hollywood often present 
that like when they're busy and good at their job, it's not sterile or clean. It's patched together, held together, spit and elbow grease. Yeah. Or like some of these dudes are literal mechanics or uh, in the case of Martin Sheen, he's like a, you know, he's just blue collar. He's got like a pair of overalls kind of shit. Right. And I think that that's translates to the broker Wall Street. You know, there's papers everywhere. Things are flying. Things are fast. You know, like. There's not People a lot of space on the phone. Yeah. Uh, for anything other than work, so there's not a lot of organizational zen. Um, for sure. That's something I noticed that dads, when we were like, give me a portrait, like, AI, give me a portrait of what a dad is, it's like dirty workspace. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, we get this scene with his dad. Um, I got a question, Abe. Does yeah. Charlie Sheen's dick work? Oh, it works so good, dude. <laughs> we get a, a faceless lady. <laughs> in the faceless next lady, <laughs> super hot lady, just gets up and walks out, and out from the bed as he's like checking his Palm Pilot. His high tech you know. computer. He his gets on his computer. We have tits and gadgets. It's again. Yeah, it's tits like, and gadgets. You're right. Yeah. It's all you need. So even though he's like kind of got a shitty apartment, uh, he's got a cool view. That's another thing. And he's got like, he, he enjoys the finer things in life. A yeah. beautiful view, a beautiful woman in your bed, a cool computer. Yep. He's got <laughs> guile too, because he is looking up Gordon Gecko's birthday. Yeah. He's going to show initiative. He's going to show that he's a go-getter. He is not taking no for an answer from Gordon and, Gecko. Uh, in the previous scene, we we heard about Gordon Gecko, Michael Douglas, and this. Yeah. Who is the hottest dad of them all? Superstar Wall Street businessman. Um, he is so, such yeah. a, he is such a dad that he has a computer to monitor his blood pressure. Because one thing we yeah. know about dads is they have problems with blood pressure. We got and he is, Yeah, and he is the ultimate daddy. When he goes into that office, he's like got to monitor my blood pressure, got it all on my computer. And it's like, oh yeah, he has a whole fucking computer for that. He's got a whole computer just for his blood pressure. So he, so he knows when it's okay to fuck. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's what his life is like. Mm -hmm. I don't know what your life is like, but that's, oh, that yeah. speaks to me. That speaks to me, man. Yeah. Uh, I also love that Charlie Sheen has like his friends in his office who razz him about being down on their luck. Yes. Like, and also they talk about crushing ass, you know, like that's f friends will rag on you and that's just something bros do. Right. And bro, what are bros if not future dads? Yeah. Um, it's just hilarious to me that it's just the, uh, atmosphere, the, the culture of this movie is not that like derogatory or like, uh, like over the top as like something like Wolf of Wall Street, but it's just so like matter of fact about yes. like all these things. Like, oh yeah, yeah, that would just and it's like simple shit. It's like the simplicity of just like, hey man, what you doing later? Crushing ass, and it's just yeah. like, man, this is these almost feel like uh ver like robot versions of dads. <laughs> oh yeah, so easy to. I do. mean, it's like a little Glenn Gary Glenn Ross, but like it, right. like the part Ollie Michael Douglas is like henchman says we got close to a half a million shares in the bag and he starts humping the air like it's shit like yeah. that where they're like oh yeah baby we got this yeah we are I making money you know we are making money yeah so yeah as you were mentioning the first kind of act one propeller aspect of this movie like the sequence two is charlie sheen just try being persistent trying to get in michael douglas's office we hear that he's turned down for months. Finally, he gets some cigars, uh, which is a total dad present. Yep. You literally get that for when they have a child. And he finally gets his foot in the door because a really good cigar is hard to get. Right. So we I mean, learn he, that Char Charlie Sheen, through his like access to, you know, kind of the blue collars of the world, um, yep. he has access to shit that other people in this Wall Street world do not have, which is valuable to Michael Douglas. And Michael Douglas says shit like sport and chemo sabi. He does. He also, and, he, yeah. he, I mean, he's just given the ultimate test here. He has to wait in a waiting room. Mm -hmm. um, and then he has to give like a speech to Michael Douglas. Um, mm -hmm. So like he has to have his time wasted and he has to speak. He has to do speech. And mm -hmm. yeah, he, he accepts him 
for what you're saying as like like it's very clear that he really just wants a fall guy <laughs> But yeah, because uh, he's uninterested in any of the stocks that Charlie Sheen is right, presenting. And it's like, he's like, I know all this shit. Dude. Yeah, I'm he's like, really I have these job. people, you know? Yeah. I need something you can't. Like, I need someone who will do crimes. I need like someone right. who can get these cigars, basically. But, it's so clear. Right. But you also see that like, we use this to also show that Gecko is kind of a man of the people too, in an opposite way. We've seen this a few. So like Devil's Advocate, there's a part where like, Al Pacino rides the subway, right? With the common man. Right. Um, uh, Succession has a lot of these moments. The idea that these people weren't born rich. They, right. they, they know. And so like, and we're supposed to have like a little respect, like it makes them formidable. And he says like, you can cut the cheap salesman stuff and stuff like that. That just like right. his dad says to him is like, no, you're, you're not, don't talk like a big city fancy boy. We're not big city fancy boys here. You know, I'm, I'm a right. real dad. Because you also get the sense that in order to become as highly successful, anyone like that, it kind of has to work their way up or understand the survival aspect of like a dog eat dog world. Yeah. Um, yet at the same time, he says stuff to Charlie Sheen, like, get yourself a suit. You can't come in here looking like crap. Yeah. So it's like that not only is it mentor menti nagging that's happening where he's like sizing him up, but it's also like there's a standard like. Right. Yeah, we came from the gutter, but like, and I recognize that about you, but we have, we're higher class than the fucking, the Cretans walking the streets, you know? Right. Like, so there is this weird um, kind of, uh, I guess, paradox in terms of his thinking, or I guess it just make him, makes him a hypocrite more than anything. Yeah, I think, I think the idea here is um, he's, he's showing that he's formidable because he, he's a regular Joe, but he is better. You know, he considers himself better. And then like, yeah, the red flag is obviously like, he wants him to get a suit and get these superficial things and to treat him well, give him some money. And so, but like he, you know, if I was Charlie Sheen right now, I'd be asking, wait, what did I do to wow this guy? Yeah. <laughs> because he even says like, I don't want another fucking money guy, another nerd. So it's like, yeah. Oh yeah. He just what wants a henchman. Want? He yeah, just yeah. wants a fall guy. That's all he sees in this guy. Right, and he's just like, here's this useless guy who showed up on in, in my office and gave yeah. me stuff. And he's, he's also him. got a value for loyalty, which I was just watching Futurama the other day, and it reminded me of like Zap Branding, and he's like, all I want, you can drink beer and sit around all day as long as you have, I have your full loyalty. Right, and it's just like, oh, that means that you're gonna kill me, <laughs> you know, like that's, and that's kind of what the setup here is, is just be loyal. That's all I ask. Right. You always got to ask that question. And he's you got to ask questions about that. Yeah. And like these scenes are basically him showing that he's the big daddy. Like when they play fucking that indoor tennis, whatever the fuck it's called. And Michael Douglas isn't sweating at all. And, and Charlie Sheen right. is like nearly dead. And Michael Douglas goes, not bad for a city college boy. Because again, he's from the streets. Um, mm -hmm. And he's street smart and he's tough. You know, he can fucking physically handle I mean yeah himself. he's just got he has so much money that he can build in time to be physically <laughs> good yeah. like he's he works out Charlie Sheen never works out because he's working all the time all right so that's probably what that is but in the end what we do get is that um all that said Charlie Sheen does pitch an airline stock with some insider knowledge that he got from his dad about the unions and they kind of get rich um, based off the first few deals off of that. And yeah. It's, so it's kind of like this honeymoon phase where Michael Douglas starts opening up to Charlie Sheen. Um, and so, like, not only do we... So we get this windfall of getting in uh, Gecko's graces. It's like a whole sequence kind of montage, if you really want to think about it. And then that's also where we get Charlie Sheen starting to use that dick again. Um, yeah. You know, and then... He, yeah, this is where we get the idea that, like, are you a one-trick pony, you know? Is right. that the only thing you got from Michael Douglas? And right, that's when right. it starts getting sinister, right? It starts getting sinister. But I just wanted to notice that, like, as soon as he's, the gates open, uh, what do we get? We get him in a limo, like, with an escort, doing cocaine, 
while he's getting blown. Getting a beach, yep. And I think it's it's just dad fantasy. Well, I guess I wouldn't assume that's specific dads. It's, you know, that's a mom fantasy Again, too. Again, it's temptations. It's, it's just temptation immediately. Um, and that's, you know, what you'd expect. But that's where the, you know, kind of psychological, or not psychological, but philosoph- uh, philosophical kind of backing and debate of this movie right is going to take place right and it can't compete with like his other his old daddy lou who's at his job who right keeps saying things like he gives him like old dad old world advice he says no such thing as except death and taxes about him telling yeah. him he's got a short thing he says remember there are no shortcuts uh son slow and steady you know you gotta you gotta you gotta you, you can't cheat you gotta just uh stay the course and of course that shit is ultimately going to be seen as morally right but not sexy right is kind of what they're pointing out and that's yeah and that's the so we're having this creation of the false dad relationship the mentor mentee yeah uh with michael douglas and uh charlie sheen and the advice that michael douglas tells charlie sheen on the other hand is stuff like get a suit but also read the art of war yeah which i think is another great daddy trope because if you're the best and have that huge dick energy you're also pretty good at war and strategy that's right. like across the board even in like the fugitive right it was always the resourcefulness of harrison ford that got him out of the problem so yeah. i think it's a product of being scrappy and knowing that your life will lead you to having to deal with survival um, right. What this movie is pointing out is that isn't worth anything without heart. Like, yes, you right. have to be scrappy. You can't he's, be ruthless. Yeah, he's going to be scrappy throughout this movie, whether he's doing good or bad things. But you need that heart to learn how to direct your scrappiness, right? For the right, right. things. And that is always what's on the pinpoint, right? Like other f- dad films like Heat, 310 to Yuma, uh, Master Commander. There's always something to wi- like it. That battle is what weighs on the mind of the dad. How ruthless to be. How prepared uh, I need to be in order to protect what I consider important. That is the classic dad dilemma because the dad has these fantasies about being the protector, about being the provider and the person who will be right when logic needs to take over and they know when to activate. So anything that threatens that, like, well, maybe you don't have to activate. That's a problem. Maybe you're being too ruthless. Well, that's a problem. There's like many things that can um, threaten that. But ultimately, it's having some kind of clean conscience along with the, you know, confidence that you're correct when it deals when dealing with this ruthlessness problem. Yeah. Um, so that's what that's what we're going to talk about. That's that's what the movie's going to try to focus on. Yeah. It's, it's In, all about yeah. that moral compass. Um, he, yeah, this is the, around the area, he uses that guile and that cleverness to track a guy going to Pennsylvania to figure out what he, company he's buying, right? And they screw mm-hmm. over this guy, ultimately. Um, everything's still working out here, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because this movie has three different lightly, like, the same montages where it's just like... There's so uh, many montages. Uh, with like honeymoon phases in particular with like he's getting money everything's going great <laughs> you know the one like, that made me laugh the was job. him uh getting his apartment ready to the talking heads which ended up being their yeah. fucking end credit song too it was like do we need this i mean i love this song but do we need this it's montage just a vibe, dude it's yeah. just a vibe yeah in fact but the devil's about- advocate also did that because it's about again the gaining of stuff and gadgets is very alluring right is having stuff we're getting having around the stuff. part where we stuff reveal status bro. yeah because the guy he's getting into is an interior or the lady he's getting into is an interior decorator um it's let's not it, get ahead of ourselves all right but she's the let's stuff person ahead. yeah it, she's the stuff person and yeah. she's kind of as superficial as gecko but um i want to talk about how the honeymoon starts to get stale at a certain point there's a scene with gordon gecko where he gives a speech in a limo he's like you're either inside or outside do you have what it takes to become private jet rich right and this is what it basically means is that charlie sheen will have to spy on this british investor uh terrence stamp played by terrence stamp yeah this character is sir lawrence wildman yeah i mean british the dad dad super british British. (laughs) and after some surveillance this so this is the first like true action that like charlie sheen takes under the you know kind of tutelage of 
Mark, or it's not Martin Sheen of uh, Michael Douglas, where it's like you have to go in and do surveillance on this guy, find out what it what his play is. Turns out his play is for a steel company. Knowing this, Gecko then goes and beats him to the punch, buys a shit ton of that stock, forcing Stamp to buy all that stock off off of him at a higher price. So basically, we learn maybe forty minutes in. That Gecko's secret and why he's successful isn't that he's a corporate raider. He steals from other brokers' plays and people who want to get businesses started and just fucks them over. And he doesn't care about factory conditions or unions or workers' rights or anything. He's just there to get the highest price point on his advantage. He's Um, dishonorable. He's dishonorable. Um, And that's... And we see this all go down at his, like, kind of beach house where is where we meet... In the new phase, the richer than God kind of phase, they have like the Rocky Three robot <laughs> butler, Daryl Hannah and Sean Young is there, uh, the finest fabrics and stuff like that. And we get that, ro- which I forgot how much of the romance, the, this movie is a romance with Daryl Hannah and Charlie Sheen. There's quite yeah. a bit of scenes. I mean, it's um, mostly a romance between me and that robot butler. Oh uh, my God. Uh, the fact that he... Hot. Robot Butler, man. That again, he's the daddy. He has all. Th- did you know this is the first film to show a cell phone? Um, oh, really? Yeah, because again, th- their daddies love gadgets. Billy Bob with his cup and the judge. Um, we love yep. gadgets, and the idea is: look at Gordon Gecko. He is the father of gadgets. He has mm-hmm. a robot fucking butler. Something that I love that we thought we was a thing that we was had in the eighties. Not was gonna happen, already was happening. Like we in the eighties, there was movies like fucking Rocky that were like, not only will we have robots, but we actually already have robots. Yeah, the rich people have already done robots. Yeah. Here. And then and we'll the cell phone. And then uh, earlier we skipped over where he shows the guy his little TV. And he's like, check yeah. it out. Check it it's, out. He always, and then TV. later we see the VHS <laughs> camera. They always, they draw the attention to be like, look at the gadgets he has. Oh, yeah. He, and he, when he's um, s- later, when he's stealing, like uh, he's just breaking into places. He has this like scanner. Yeah. That is like the silliest scanner because it's like a little handheld device that you roll over the paper as opposed to, you know, it's so it's like. I guess those exist because you can't like move a whole printer over to the. Yeah, it's but like it's just funny because it makes the sound and goes like zip, 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 zip. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like oh hell yeah, dude! It's gadgets. a gadget up in there. He also shows off his cool guns. Dad love they love yeah. gadgets. Gadgets. This gadgets. movie is filled. We love gadgets. With it's gadgets. so true. Yeah. Look, and also, and also, we love. Um, we get that romance started with Daryl Hannah, and I think it's important to mo. No, uh, notice that he's like as soon as he starts flirting he drops I'm from the Upper West Side in other words I can live with the pores yeah deal with it like so it's so funny to me when where it's like you hide your background in some instances right when you want to be sh- seen as the professional but then other times you want to be seen as like rugged ladies and love one a of those bad insta- boy it's because d- ladies love a bad boy yeah um He's Michael Douglas reminds Charlie Sheen at this point that like, hey, dude, school's out. Even though we've had some success, you got to keep doing good or you're out. So basically this pyramid scheme he's set up, there's no loyalty in Michael Douglas's world. This is a right. cardinal dad sin. You have to, the, loyalty is a must for dad films. Yes. And the correctly positioned loyalty as well. Because loyalty to Michael Douglas is, um, you know, that is an abomination. But Michael Douglas himself, as a kind of philosophical, you know, like experimentation, he has no loyalty. So he, that's why he's an abomination. He doesn't have any true friends. It's just people who benefit from his success. Yeah. Um, and I th- love that they include the scene. I want to know what your thoughts on the scene are, if I'm reading it right. Because there's a phone call. All right, this is the, the like the the what I'm talking about is this whole scene with the phone call. But we're at the end. Michael Douglas admires the beauty of a sunset, and then it immediately pivots. Like he's almost like punch drunk. Like it's weird. He's kind of just rambling, and he's just like, "I'm looking at the sunset. It's so beautiful." And then it reminds him like almost instantaneously he's like and just reminds me that there's so much money to be made right and it's like greed is his sunset like i think is that yeah, is this scene trying just to, to show, show that how highly he puts greed i in think admiration? i think this movie is about 
like you know charlie sheen's character is someone who cannot who is who is on the line right his soul is up for grabs he's up for grabs yeah and then you have uh martin sheen who is he has found the right path and then mm. you have all these other lost souls who are on varying degrees of that scale the people he works with and stuff like that who their moral compasses are screwed to certain extents i think we want to show that it is in the blood of michael douglas that he is irredeemable and that this is this is what he lives for. He's e- yeah, he's evil, and he is like a predator. And so, like, we're supposed to see a little bit of reverence for that, the way we see reverence for a literal like a, a predator, a lion, right? Um, you know, famous predator, the gecko, and uh, and so yeah, <laughs> I think it's a little bit of that, and. I think it's the first time a cell phone was in a movie and they wanted to they really like, that's cool. Yeah, they wanted to be like, look at he's looking at the sunset and the beach while talking. It's the fucking future. It's also just like I'm using a gadget and it's it's awesome. Right. And so that's I think it's all those probably things. something I wasn't thinking about. That's pretty funny. I just think it's kind of awesome. Like I love this scene because it's like whatever Whatever you see when you like admire the glory of a sunset. Yeah. Like whatever some people call it spiritual, some people are just like it's, you know, like it's just very pretty or right. whatever. It really but depends like everyone, on how much acid you've taken, but go on. <laughs> but regardless, people can be in the awe uh, in awe of nature. Right. And I just love that they include that like he has that too. He's not like not a person. He admires the sunset and goes like that's beautiful. But it's the the problem, the psychological blunder is what it reminds him of. So it's like this Rorschach test where well, it's like, do you want, do you want to, here's a test, uh, Michael Douglas, and your result is you're an evil man. Right. And the, uh, the test is great. also anti-big city, right? It's a beach right. sunset. It's the idea of like, he's out of the big city um, mm-hmm. and he still can't stop thinking about big city ideas. He is, he yeah. has been, ha- you know, he's, he's fully gone, fully and just possessed by it. Yeah. So we start to see, we, we keep going down the rabbit hole. We keep going into hell and we see that, uh, Charlie Sheen has become flippant with his new insider trading hints. He's, he's casually dealing. giving tips to James Spader. Who's his lawyer. Like he's handing out money. Like he's fucking Robin Hood now. Well, at this point he's trying to. Like, this is when Gordon was like, you need to do more. Um, yeah. And so we can't just coast on that one fucking idea. It's like the Simpsons episode with Marge in that dress. Like, it's just like, it, you, you got in the door from that, but right. you need to show Schools use. Out. So so this is when he's starting to, yeah, he's starting to take on the gecko attitude and I love... of his underlings. When it, go, when it starts getting, you know, very desperate is when he does it to his dad. And it's like, you know, don't bullshit a bullshitter. Moment. He knows that, yeah. And he what's crazy right is I love that the this movie. This is just like admi- admiration for like the writing of this movie. Like often you'll have this question about like why is he doing this? Like you know, is this some form of altruism? Like he's learning. Uh, he's gonna give his friends like some help, and then we learn after the fact. Oh no, no, he's just using his friends as straw buyers to provide more income for himself and gecko yeah. this is so a, it's done to avoid big buys from one person right so you, he's literally fucking over his friends yeah you mentioned robin hood because at the end he does this a, a few other times right where he tells his friends to right. do this thing for the greater good and actually starts using his powers to help but there's this idea that like yeah they they, they wanted to make it so that it has to be like a heroic thing or like or a betrayal, right? And that he can wield this power to help other people or hurt other people. And they're sort of showing it here, right? Also, yeah, like Robin Hood, yeah. we learn that he, he wears disguises, but we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Um, yeah, because literally, like, the only thing I wanted to mention about the um, that scene is that even, as you mentioned with, like, his dad, who would be obviously the first person to say, like, hey, dude, what the fuck is Spader is even taken back by this? Basically yeah. going, like, buddy, you've changed. And that's just, we have to have that pointed out. Yeah. But, yeah, as you mentioned or as you're alluding to, Charlie Sheen literally starts breaking into companies and reading files about their finances. Right. He's using and, Dial for bad, but it's yeah, Dial. He, He's using it's just gadgets. Funny to me. 
disguises. He's using gadgets. It's true. He's like, like a spy. Yeah, we love disguise. Heat, Robin Hood. Well, like we've done a few, right? Didn't Master Commander? Didn't they disguise their ship? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. They, yeah Dad it's films all about Guile, love disguises, uh, and and this one is no different. Yeah, and I just think it's it, yeah, it's just funny that he's basically just a robber at this point. He's just a bank robber. Yeah. Uh, like, how do you not know that? Like, you, Gordon Gecko, just like totally changed your life. I guess he's just been taken back by it. Yeah. How sexy the life is. It's the temptation, baby. Uh, around the midpoint, we get a scene with um, Charlie Sheen and Martin Sheen where dad is resistant to the new influx of money in Charlie Sheen's life. Uh, but Charlie Sheen also from that conversation gets more union info. Um, and this gives yes. him an idea about an acquisition that he could make. So they, it's just, even though he's being told, like, it's he's, it's beautiful midpoint. Even though he's <laughs> he's been told like, hey dude, like this is what you need to do to change your life, or, like answer the call. He's just straight up like, ah, oh, I'm gonna double down, and uh, like my takeaway from that conversation is that I'm going to be even more in the graces of Gecko. Yeah, and there's a fantastic reveal at this point. I don't know if you even saw it as a reveal or were supposed to, but we find out at a party that Gecko has a small child, and I love that maneuver. It's not really a twist. It's just like we've spent an hour with this guy, and we had no clue that he had a family. Hey, <laughs> I have like, a question. Yeah, what's up? Does Gordon Gecko's dick work? Oh, he, it works so good. <laughs> it works yeah, so good. Sean Young. Yeah, dude. Yeah, his dick works. It's and great. as we're going to learn, he's a man who cheats too. Yeah. So and, he's just an abomination when it comes to family life. Right. This is another one of those scenes where uh, the main character should have thought about it because they're literally making him sign papers to give him like power of attorney. And they're saying like, listen, all the trades you do don't go back to Gordon. So like, you know, you do something wrong. It stops at you. And he should really think about this for a second and go like, I think you might be throwing me under the bus. Yeah. <laughs> but he's like, okay, I see you have a cool VHS camera and your dick works. So yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of dick working, we get that kind of, it's like we're in the honeymoon phase really with the Daryl Hannah arc, like his romance arc with Charlie Sheen. Yeah. And she loves expensive things. Basically at this point, Charlie Sheen is all in and he needs all of his non-rich friends to help out. Um, and he needs it to work because of the new expensive lifestyle. Yeah. He gets promoted at work. He's got a new assistant, new office, new he's the new high the monthly high earner. He buys a new apartment. And Daryl Hannah uh is, as you mentioned, interior decorator, does his new place. Can I say that she sucks? Yeah, I mean, so in her defense, it's the eighties where everything looked bad. It's so true. The eighties, that high art style, everything looks like a goddamn cabbage patch kid. It's garbage, yes. It's and garbage. I, I couldn't tell if she was bad or just that the eighties that was bad. The, yeah, that's probably right. That's probably yeah. Close. Yeah, because he seems to like it, so fuck it. Yeah, um, exactly. And so it seems like he's at his highest high, and then you hit him with the right cross baby classic story shit. And this movie comes in the form of uh charlie sheen's friendships seem to have changed he's more of the asshole and he's like straight up yelling at them yeah and michael douglas is fucking daryl hannah yep because his so, dick works i mean everyone's dick works it's true but it's just the idea that but michael his, douglas is yeah his dick works better the, he's the fucking fox in the hen house right yeah the gecko in the fox the house. gecko in the fox house and so at a stockholders meeting their current acquisition Telled our paper, the board of directors is having like a big meeting or whatever the fuck you do. And they're like, do not buy into this Gordon Gecko dude. He's a he's like a snake oil sna salesman. And Michael Douglas gives a speech, presents himself as someone who's fighting for the future of this paper company. Oh, he's and sticking that, it to the the big guy. He's saying these stockholders who own these bureaucrats. These I wanna, rich managers. I want to point this out because like this is the point in a movie where the villain would like if it was an action movie, you'd see the villain win, do something to show that they're very formidable, that they're not to be fucked with. And they do right. that here, but it's in the <coughs> weapon that they've chosen to use speeches, talking, salesman, fancy yeah. talking. So he goes up and he does the ultimate attack as a speech. Dads love speeches. We love speeches. And, and this one is a famous one. Too. Yeah. It's well known. And like, if you haven't seen this film, 
Uh, you can look for, like, they write about the greed is good speech. Yeah. Uh, he talks about how greed works. America was built on greed. He's using the power of speech to do bad. Yeah, he really is. Um, and there's a great dad shot because, um, like, because immediately after this, we get, like, behind closed doors. My, Martin Sheen is there. The, you know, the P, because w- what we're, ha- we're having is this new Blue Star Airlines that uh like Charlie Sheen is pitching this idea to Gecko. Like, yeah. what if we buy the airline, expand it? Which I'm is president. His, his dad work is a he fixes planes yeah. for this comp it the whole union stuff was for this airline, which is important. Right. And so this is like the big buy. This is the big thing, the big idea that like, you know, my uh Michael Douglas is like into. He's like, Yeah, this sounds good because um using we're going to get savings achieved by like the fact that we're going to do this is going to give us a ton of union concessions and it's already an overfunded pension so this is all information that martin sheen gave charlie sheen and charlie sheen passed on to michael douglas uh and so it's this whole acquisition happens and um there's a great dad shot which is Martin Sheen is like now in this, uh, in his apartment, in uh, Charlie Sheen's apartment, and he has this like sushi maker that like rolls up the. He's just making sushi like crazy. Yeah. And Martin Sheen <laughs> sniffs at the sushi. Big city su- sushi. Uh, su- yeah, that's what sushi represents. And he yeah. looks near camera and he's just unimpressed. Just this totally is the, bad judgment. This is the biggest scene. The meeting of the daddies. It's money yeah. daddy versus down to earth daddy. It reminded me of like. When fucking Aunt May meets the Green Goblin in the <laughs> at, at Thanksgiving, um, and you know it's going to be a big blow up because it's the battle Finish of the it. ideologies about the, yeah. the the two the f- competing daddies and this you know this big city daddy greedy they're daddy not, they're incompat they're oil and water baby they can't but they're both they know daddies what they are. and you can they tell are, because they're- Michael Douglas accidentally spills the sushi because he can't tell that the 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 coffee table is he thinks it's glass which just feels right. like a very daddy thing to do he's he's uh he doesn't understand art um or like you know interior decorating or whatever right 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 it's to kind of show i i thought that was more to show that the yeah art or the high um kind of high society does some paradoxical and stupid things. Right. Uh, and even people who can mo- move through that uh, culture and society well don't know how to deal with it sometimes. Kind of like Brazil a little bit. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and th- but in any case, there is similarities between them, for sure. I mean, this yeah, is I mean, just a scene that is about how they're different. Right, and it's him just sort of saying, like, basically they're trying to sell him on because he represents the unions and that support sell them on this acquisition. And they said, they're going to use that big city tech, right? They're going to, mm-hmm. they're going to squeeze the dimes out of the little guy. They're going to make the seats more expensive. Um, and while all the other representatives are like, sure, that sounds fine. Down to earth daddy sees right through it. And he says, and I they love came this. into Egypt, a Pharaoh. Yeah. They did not know. I uh, love dads love quoting shit, especially yeah. stuff from antiquity. Right. Yeah. Because we read those fucking books. And then they say about like Romans and shit. <laughs> you know, your scum CEO drove this place into the ground. He goes, That scum CEO made something out of nothing. He he built this airline with his own two hands. And Working class dad, V greed dad. And makes you made things in this country. Yep. You and gotta yeah. make things. But you know, Wall Street you're not making shit. You're just moving things around. See, right. that's the problem. That's this is why definitely never be a true dad. The first time you watch this movie, the first time I watched it, I knew it immediately what the full arc was going to be. The first time he met with his dad, who's talking about yeah, the airline. Just like, oh, I was like, yeah, Oh, he's going to accidentally dissolve his dad's airline. Isn't he? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I love just the scene in general about it's like, they're comparing their manhoods. Yeah. Like, uh, and, uh, that causes Michael uh, Martin Sheen and Charlie Sheen to have kind of this kind of heart to heart, but really it's a, it's, th- it's what sometimes dads do this with sons. It's more of a threatening heart to heart yeah. because it's stuff like you're too blind to see that he's, you got your prick. He's got, 
You he's, got your prick in his got, pocket. Yeah, he's got your prick shit, in his pocket. Your prick in his pocket. And then he is the line. And then he comes, he quips back, you know, you're just jealous because your son is more successful than you. So they're, they're, we have this strained father son relationship, which is classic dad, but it's all because of this abomination of dad in the room, Michael Douglas. Right. And at the heart of it is kind of how do you sleep at night, Charlie Sheen? How does yep. that guy sleep at night? Because I sleep at night fine is what Martin Sheen is saying. Right. And that's what we all aspire to be is dads who can sleep at night. And this resolves with Martin Sheen going like, well, I must have been a lousy father if you're going to, if this is like what you're doing with your life. Yeah. And which at is some the point, most shameful thing you can do in dad land. Oh yeah. At some point, Charlie Sheen gives him his word too, right? Because the word is breaking your word. Big ultimate dad crime. You yeah. go to dad jail for that. So yeah, like it is, you know, it's a dark moment for dads everywhere this scene right and then we get you know the act three the downfall basically which is charlie sheen and michael douglas's deals have attracted the attention of the sec soon afterward bud learns that gecko's plans to dissolve the company and sell off blue star in general yep. um after this acquisition is just gonna access cash in the company's pension plan stealing that money because it's now up for grabs leaving uh, Martin Sheen and all of the entire Blue Star staff unemployed. Yep. And that proves that Martin Sheen was correct in the previous scene. Yeah. And in the board of directors meeting is when Charlie Sheen kind of realizes that Michael Douglas is going to fuck him. So he confronts him, which is shows that he, Charlie Sheen is not Michael Douglas because Michael Douglas would just fuck him back. Right. But Charlie Sheen confronts him because he's like, I can save this. We can talk this out. Maybe he doesn't know that he's doing this. Can I convince him to be do otherwise? That's the actions of a man who was raised by Martin Sheen, not by like a Mar uh, Michael Douglas type, right? It's true. And so basically, Michael Douglas is like, I don't give a shit about all those people. Yeah, he speeches him again. He he throws yeah. the power of speeches in him and he gives him another evil speech about greed and shit and like yeah. how none of this yeah. matters. And Charlie Sheen is like, how much is enough? How many yachts? And that's a great yeah. question. And again, Charlie Sheen, going to other aspects of his life, he goes to Daryl Hannah, who confines, confides that he's like, look, I, I've had a recent fall. I'm not like, I'm not making as much money and I'm, I want to go back on this deal with this because I, you know, I don't want to fire my dad kind of thing. And Daryl Hannah is basically just don't cross Gordon. Yeah, Keep this is the work. This is the which, most straw man shit. This felt. Yeah. This is the idea of you know those big city women. All they want is money and abortions, and they yeah. will they will fucking abandon you the moment you, you are <laughs> valuable. Yeah, it's very funny. Yeah, it's that it's basically just like, Yeah, it's like dad justice. She bought yeah. into the system hook like a new seeker, and he hasn't yet. Apparently, even though you know he, he yeah. flirted with it, it's just funny. <laughs> It's very Jezebel. funny. It's just, again, such a straw man. I love it. Yeah. Uh, we learned that uh, Martin Sheen off screen has had a heart attack. Yeah. The killer dad of dads. Yeah. Of illness. Yeah. Uh, probably from all that red meat that he eats. And, and the we smoking. Get to, and the smoking. Which yeah. they have a nice little thing with this where it starts with Charlie Sheen being like, Dad, you got to stop smoking. And throughout the film, he slowly starts smoking himself. Uh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And we get the, what I would argue is the true dad porn like we t we joke all about all the time about like dad's dicks working dad's um you know loving gadgets dad's loving war machines and big uh you know planes and shit and trains and tanks these are all the like surface stuff which is fun and it's all true that's what you know it's like why we like sports or whatnot it's right. you know you can say that about the dads of the species but in my argument what really makes dad movie and the philosophical kind of conundrum that we love to expose at each other so that we can get a scene like this which is charlie sheen goes to martin sheen's hospital bed and charlie sheen basically says i you were right and i'm sorry and i, I love, love you. you dad and they're both and crying charlie sheen they both or They're Martin crying. Sheen looks away. He can't look at him while Sheen he cries. Martin Sheen closes his eyes and looks away because he can't. He can't cry. And their actual father and son. Actual father yeah. and son. This is a phenomenal scene. Like outside of the dadness of it all, this is just two actors doing a great just job. killing it. Yeah, yeah. And it and it's this is dad porn to me. Yeah, this is true dad porn because it's it's 
what it's we've the done. It's the money shot. <laughs> it's, it's what they've done to us. Yeah. It's, it's what they've done to men. Like, not to get like gender studies about it, but like one of the huge internet criticisms been around forever, all that stuff is that uh, men are not allowed to confront their emotions openly. Right. Um, and something that we have a high regard for is other men who are also strong and have helped us in times where we needed help. Um, that is like the foundation of a mentor, ment- uh, you know, mentee or a father son relationship. So to get a scene where it's like, I can't hold back any longer. I'm not going to cry. Not like a woman, you know, but I'm going to stifle my tears at this man. That's, we love that shit. That shit, that's why like, like it's everything in the movie, like October Sky that's leading up to that, you know, scene where Jake Gyllenhaal says, uh, you know, Werner von Braun is a great scientist, but he's not my hero. And it's like dot, dot, dot. It's like the implication is you're my hero, Chris Cooper, America's dad. And it's just like that shit we love, dude. And that's what this and this movie, you're, spe- you're right, because it's an actual father son. Yeah. It's like a really strong scene version of this, right? Yeah, it's real good. Real good. Got to stay strong. One day you and I are going to have this scene. Of course. Or we'll, we'll both stay strong, be in right? a hospital bed. Yeah. <laughs> both be in hospital, but we both had heart attacks. Yeah. Uh, so to take Gecko down, Blue Star reaches out to Terrence Stamp. If we remember, hates Gordon Gecko because he fucked him out of that other deal with the steel uh, shares. Charlie Sheen apologizes to his friends. They're like, hey, I was an asshole. Basically, uh, I'm a good guy now tour that we sometimes see in movies where yeah. he goes around and like gives all his money away kind of his shit. His friends Basically, forgive him pretty quickly. <laughs> Yeah, and they're like, ah, you're fine. Because he gives them a stock tip, too. Again, he's now (laughs) doing it for good. He goes, like, you know, put it on. He's doing, quote, the right thing. You you know, it's all insider trade. Yeah. But basically, after some moves, it comes down to Gordon Gecko having to sell all of his Blue Star stock because it's, like, worthless now, uh, and it's only going to get worse. So at one point, he says, oh, well, so we only made $10 million. And then you realize, oh, shit, that all of this stuff seems small stakes until you put a number on it. Right. And uh, Charlie Sheen basically wins and realizes that... uh, and and, He has uh, the no moment where he realizes that his his enemy bought up all the stocks and bought the airline under him yep. and he has this like son of a bitch because he realizes he's been he's been tricked he outsmarted he him he outguiled him. him uh you know and he realizes that and it took him too long to realize that charlie sheen was the guy who did it like yeah using the power of talking talking at people calling talking at people wheeling getting, and dealing yeah. he's it's on martin or, or uh fucking uh, Gecko's battleground, right on Michael Douglas's battleground. Yeah, he's like, he... "This is where I taught you," and yeah. now he's now he, now now who's king? And so at his highest, you know, we've we've gotten that arc now. We've gotten he like defeated the dragon. He became a better man. He survived, but just then the SEC arrests Charlie Sheen for because fraud because he violated the because he because he violated the code. That's he what still, you get. He didn't do a cool crime. He didn't rob a bank. He didn't cool. He right. he. He he is unhonorable still. You gotta pay the price. It's a dad. And film. I loved this scene. I forgot how much this, how great this scene is when he walks shamefully out of his awful uh, office in handcuffs. And like how crying, Charlie yeah. Sheen crying like a little child, like about it. Just like it's better than any scene in right. Wolf of Wall Street. Dude. I was really like, hoping so he'd good. like try to run. <laughs> yeah, he'd, like, he's just like oh, it's, him. it's like, like semi pathetic. I don't want to. But he's also trying to keep it together. Like he's like, I'll see you when I get out, man. Right. You know, it's like good he's because he's nice. supposed to be our hero, and so <laughs> it's not the everyone cr- claps moment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I just love how they, like, it's just not expected. Uh, well, it's again, fantastic. It's, it's about justice. It's this idea of like right. you got to pay the price, even if you did the right thing at the end, you still have to pay the price. You have to mm-hmm. pay for it, and and no one's gonna clap for you. And I feel like there's other movies that have done this. Um, where the hero does the right thing, but it doesn't feel good in the moment. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, And then we get a scene immediately. This is the kind of of out-of-sequence scene that I I mentioned before. It really pays off, which is Charlie Sheen meets Michael Douglas in Central Park. Yes, I was like, is this a dream? Like, it was so so weird. 
Um, yeah. Michael Douglas beats Charlie Sheen's ass. Like he just like decks yes. him like because eight times. At the end of the day, it's all about punching, right? Like, it's all about punching. Yeah. yeah. And so and he's like, like, you're in, you're, you're ungrateful. Uh, and like, that's he what he's speech. got on him. But guess what? Charlie Sheen's wearing a wire. Cause obviously he is, uh, Michael he Douglas is going down and Charlie Sheen will get a lighter sentence. Right. And he the last scene the fucking is speech against him. Yeah. 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 And Charlie, the last scene is Charlie Sheen's parents drive him to the courthouse and he, it's like, Hey, you did the right thing. Yeah, and you he, told the truth and you gave the money back. Is you what gave he the says. money back. You work with the government, and uh, there's a job at when you get out at yeah. Blue Star. It really because you helped us out. He might as well be like 12 and have a paper route. The way they're like, you built right. character, kid. You know, you gave the money back. You did the right thing. You told on your friends, um, and you're gonna go to jail for a little bit. But you'll you're be gonna back. go to jail for a little bit. But whatever, it's fine. Uh, and the. Uh, important line is that um martin sheen says at one point you're gonna create instead of living off of the buying and selling of others which is yeah. like kind of the thesis of the movie which is that this is a bad job uh more or less yeah. if you use it to buy and sell others instead of creating jobs um because that's what they were all doing and yeah that's the end of the movie um yeah so I think we can go to the smoking room. Oh, I think so. Which and is I, our kind of, con like, take this all in context with other uh, podcasts that we've done, other episodes, where it's like, what? let's talk about what we learned about dad tropes. Yeah, and, and I think we've already talked about the idea that, I think this seals it for me, that dad's like gadgets. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it's, the liking of gadgets can be seen as a lure, um, but they like him. They uh, Billy Bob and his cool cup. Um, we just like gadgets. Fucking butler robot. Um, to me, this hammered home cell phones. Yeah, yeah. This hammered home the guile stuff. Um, mm -hmm. The use of speeches. Um, you know, being clever. Uh, yep. It's. Um, I don't know if we've covered this, but I realize dads like justice. They like fairness. They like oh, we've talked about that. Get a lot, what's coming especially to them, especially because we are um, the taking or unmining of authority for a right. greater purpose. Right? Yeah, that so seems to be our big one. That's the big thing. Where dads like justice, but that's not necessarily related to the law. Oftentimes it is, but like you know, like cops got a cops, robbers got a robbers. There's this reverence for a larger system, and that system. Yes kind of involves the basic idea of honor and that dads don't fuck over other dads. Um, and the that's code. Yeah. The, and that's the human code. Yeah. What Charlie Sheen did here, you know, it's this lure of greed and cocaine and that it makes dads turn on other dads. The ultimate dad crime is using, I think the, 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 the things that dads love making money, uh, uh, fucking their dicks working, um, gadgets, uh, speeches and using that to do something dishonorable right yeah i think that that's the number one take like as in we're we're entering we this is our ninth episode yeah um you know like that's the biggest one to me is this somewhere there's something there's a better way to say it but like it's often portrayed by undermining authority but that reverence for the system in the end is for a higher system, the quote right thing or the good yeah. thing. But it's all swirling around this idea of like, sometimes you have to go against the authority. It's this form of vigilantism, honestly, yeah. that is he, wish fulfillment for a lot of dads who often just feel like they're just doing their job. Right. Just he stick to your job. He you know? uses that insider trading basically against Gecko at the end. And I don't right. think that's the crime he confesses to at the end. I no. don't like, so I think it's a pick and choose. Like, it's no, those the aren't the crimes. Trading stuff. Yeah. It's the other crimes he did for Gecko that he knows he has to go to it's, jail for. Exactly. And these, well, so I think that's like the main one. If there is one main one, I think that it's being shared by a lot of other ones. And like yeah. you mentioned some of the superficial ones, like the dicks working. Other yeah, ones I that a, I noticed, I have a list here. Okay. Like being underestimated, um, oh, having yeah. an everyman main character. That's a lot of movies, but definitely all dad movies. Yeah. Uh, there's always a philosophical uh, 
direct kind of conversation with the audience at one point, which is he's in a situation where what would you do uh, is the question of the thing. And it's usually comes down to utilitarian code, being right. selfless, uh, doing something for the greater good. What would you do in that situation? You talked about gadgets and computers, and we also have written down from other ones, big machines. Yeah. A big one for me is still linear storytelling. We've yet to see a non-linear storytelling. You're right. Uh, it's all just chronologically simple. Dad. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I have so, a question. Yeah. What's you up? mentioned at the end he's being driven by his parents, plural. Is his mom actually there? Oh, I thought maybe I saw her. Maybe, I maybe not. Maybe. I thought she was in the back seat. Oh, she could see, be dead. She could be dead because I don't remember her in any scene. And I feel like there was some vague mentioning of her. This, I just point that out because I, I I have to rewatch, but maybe women are in danger in this one. Yeah. The, I, there's not really women in this one. Kind of like master and commander. Right. Uh, that one is, we have in our list that women are always in danger. Uh, it's almost the same thing as having in like a all male cast. Right. Right. Yeah. Like obviously there's Sean Young and uh, Daryl Hannah in this movie, but they're kind of there as the background characters. Background characters. They're they don't have arcs. Yeah. They're just they they're just responses to the Charlie Sheen. And so to me, w- women are in danger. Equal sign. No women in your movie because it's basically saying that this is about this is dudes talking about dudes. Yeah, you know, it's, that's it's, what this yeah, movie. Is. Let's put those women on the shelf. Which, we Which usually by killing Which is them. fine, you know, like it, as long as you you're you know what's up, you yeah. know what you're you're saying, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, big anti-authority team building. There is a sense of the mentor, something we talk about where you get in other films, uh, you know, like in the sports movies, like there's some form of male bonding. They'll sing. Or talk about each other's dicks. Right. In this movie, their dicks work, they do. There is some form of male bonding, but it's kind of, it's not like a group. It's not like the boys. It's just that mentor-mentee relationship. Right. But that is still very important because they, I think dads need that kind of connection with some other dude. Like in True Lies, uh, it's not a mentor-mentee relationship, but like in True Lies, we have this situation with uh, Schwarzenegger where he has his Tom Arnold. You know, there's always got to be your your buddy that you can you know just razz with. Oh yeah, you gotta have a piss and shit. Yeah, um, and talk about how sexually charged you are, how physically powerful you are, how fucking horny Uh, you are and shit. Yeah, and there's that, and there's that's in here. And as we mentioned, the one I think we mentioned in the episode we haven't mentioned in this segment is the guile, right? Uh, uh, I thought we mentioned Guy a little bit, but yeah. We talked about a little bit in other episodes how gills. violence is only when necessary. It's interesting because in this movie, violence is kind of shown as to be pathetic. It's the only time we actually get violence is when Gordon Gecko is like, you fucking piece of shit. Right. It kind of shows that violence isn't necessary. A lot of dad movies... Like violence brings dad to dads together, a lot of horror movies and stuff. Right. But it's only when that aligns with the um quote right thing to do, you know, like war and tragedy, like uh master and commander and such like that. We have to do it. We have to kill these random dudes. So right. in this movie where there's no real need for killing, violence is now portrayed as a, wow, that's pathetic. As talky money stuff though, too. Like the violence mm-hmm. in this is speeching and money. Money is the violence. So in the end, he has to use his fucking money, his money skills against Gordon. That's true. His his skills. Yeah. yeah. Often violence will be a skill for a daddy. Yeah. But not always. But the point is that, yeah, he he uses his skills because he is underestimated. But there definitely is. Yeah. I mean, I think of like calling. the... Um, the uh the what's it called uh fucking the judge there's that part where like the guy wants to punch him and he uses his guile against it so like yeah yeah avoiding the avoiding the violence is a important part because i think it's all once you get into the 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 kind of male psyche or the dad psyche there's this and i don't want this to be these are all gross generalizations so take it with a you know i'm no psychologist but like 
Often it's portrayed that men are overly violent or they have to hold back their violence. This is kind of how dad movies placate the idea of like, sometimes the violence is necessary. We know sometimes you get angry and you need to punch something and you're right to do it when it's like World War II or something. But you can't walk around with that shit because then you'll be a fucking monster. Right. So we need to pervert the violence somewhat. So there's good violence and now there's bad violence that we're sending to dads. Yeah. Like our Hollywood is writing toward dads saying like, this is good violence. This is bad violence. And that's kind of fucked up. That's interesting to mm. me, you know? Yeah. Cause yeah. dads, dads are very impressionable. You got to send them the right messages. Oh, we all are. We yeah. all are very impressionable. Yeah. We just agree with whatever is shown to us. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, there's, I'm, it's, it's interesting because the more we cover these, there's ones that are totally correct, like uh, of our list of like dad trends or dad tropes, but they're all falling to the wayside over like a few that are clear every time. Like um, yes. one that I loved is like the, I, the like it, when we were talking about it, it felt so right. We had like three or four movies where this concept of plowing ahead and staying the course and doing your job was there's reverence for that kind of thing right well i think that this movie this too. doesn't truly have that well as they much. have the old dad the former boss say slow and steady right that's true there are no that's shortcuts true. and but they it's not, remember yeah. this is a cautionary dad tale so it's taking the things like that that folksy dad advice mm-hmm. and throwing it aside in a way that is sinister where it's like he's saying the right thing. There's no shortcuts. And Charlie Sheen is like, ah, whatever. In the end, he learns that. He learns that there are no shortcuts. That's, he tries to true. cheat his way to success and he loses. So I think that idea of staying the course is in here. But again, it's all about... It's just interesting what is still seen as an asset. Like I was thinking the devil's advocate also has scenes where he's underestimated, like where the guy in the subway is threatening him and then he speaks Spanish at him and everybody's like, oh, this white guy can speak Spanish. Wow. You know, like these moments where it's like, bet you didn't think I was like that. I'm clever. They do that no matter what. There's these like general vibes that are in dad films like Mm -hmm. gadgets and cleverness, right? Where they're not necessarily saying anything about it. They're just like, we like cleverness we like gadgets they can be used by the bad person or the good person same with speeches but then the moral compasses i think are still steady throughout and one being stay the course you know no shortcuts you got to play the long game etc yeah and it's and that's how we kind of tackle even though it's not in this movie uh, we mentioned staying the course is like sometimes how dad movies deal with grief, you know, like a lot of dads ad yeah. hoc re- uh, reaction to and any I, form of grieving is just everything's fine. <laughs> Everything and the, just yeah, got us. Yeah. And the, and the dads that are evil are the ones who try to cheat that they do yeah. a murder or they steal. They no do something cuts, unhonorable to try to avoid like the consequence and the, or, or having to stay the course, having to slowly make money. It's all honor, dude. I think when it comes down to it, it's all honor. Yeah. Cause that like, it just like eats up all of the whole like concept of um, reverence for the system and doing the right thing. It's like, what is honorable? defining what is honorable there is a definition that hollywood has said this is the honors of the highest honors of dad right and anything that plays towards that become this like superficial list of things where it's like you know yeah singing and laughing with the boys well that's a form of honor really when you think about it right it's It's honoring your brothers it's the stereotypes we put on motherhood and fatherhood right which is that motherhood is supposed to be about compassion and nurturing and taking care of a family, whereas a dad is supposed to be, again, supposed to, it's all in big quotes, obviously, um, to be the moral compass and the, the honor and the person who keeps the family, you know, um, you know, honest and, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, traditionally is supposed to be the money person, the person to keep, keeps everything functioning that way again all traditional but i think it's worth talking about when talking about a dad movie because i think they're often right. very much built off of these stereotypes you know over the yeah, years and i think it's interesting that we get this like so with this honor code right we get this weird system 
uh, vigilanteism in a lot of these movies, which is seen as a wish fulfillment and sometimes seen as like, that's a bad thing. Right. But in other times it's like, you're fucking Batman, dude. Yeah. And so like you challenge authority, but you don't disrupt it. And there's this like weird navigation that goes along with the vigilanteism where you're doing the right thing, but res- uh, there's some reference for, or re- reverence for some f- form of the system. Like whatever the system was built for, that's still there in its essence. The system has just become corrupted. Yeah. And so that's why you're allowed to challenge authority. But in other instances, don't challenge the authority because that's all working fine. So it's like whatever the makers of a dad movie decide of this is not working fine and this is working fine, they put into two different buckets and then our main character is allowed to fuck with the bucket of wrong stuff. Right. And and as long as they don't cross the, quote, right thing or the bucket that has all the things that it's like, we don't have an issue with that. Um, that is what we allow ourselves in dad movies to do, which is interesting because some dad movies have reverence for systems that other dad movies don't. And they, you know, can be k- kind of antithetical to each other. I think of 310 to Yuma oh, 100%. Uh, in particular, where well, it's like we, yeah. And yeah. that one we mentioned is a unique one because it's almost like neither dad is wrong, neither dad is right. Yeah. Uh, that's not, that's pretty unique to the movies we've talked about. For sure. It's exploring that morality. Yeah. Because ultimately it's the writers making it right where it's like, right. Like with with Batman, that's why so many uh, like eighties action and current action even has is feels very like right wing and what they're talking about where they're like co- cops don't get it done, but also honor the cops, but also we gotta you know like that's very similar to like militias that exist in America, um, mm-hmm. oath keepers and stuff where they're like you know they're they're like res- you know respect blue lives matter, but also. <laughs> fuck the cops <laughs> like i'm yeah there's a, and so like there's this short yeah. circuiting and so like with dad films i think they often try to navigate that and and the answer is usually they create these ultra hyper specific scenarios like the city of gotham where you're like right. okay i guess in this very weirdly specific scenario i guess we need a batman like <laughs> yeah. all right but like most of the time you don't um, but or they have to create like, these weird parameters. You do have to create these weird parameters because I think that that's like kind of the uh, preface of like libertarianism because libertarianism is like, we see it come up a lot in a lot of like John Carpenter films and stuff like that. There's a kind of a libertarian thrust and it's yeah. not about as much the politics, but it's about the idea of libertarianism existing I won't say that it's antithetical or an antithesis to like Democrats or uh, Republicans or liberals or conservatives. Right. But of all of the isms, libertarianism is definitely one that is a lot of contrarians involved because Mm -hmm. they're like, I want to pick. Yeah, I love weed. Legalize weed. But also let's take down the Fed. You know, it's like you, you have just a random assortment of values and you just want those values to be taken and you know yeah i mean if we're talking politics you want to be a system yeah we're talking about politics in general i think this is a good parallel to dad movies because ultimately there's so many where it just comes down to a person's values that they then right. have decided i want everybody to have those values <laughs> um yeah i mean that's most movies that because all movies are inherently political in my mind you know yeah, because you're creating a world, right? You're creating, you're creating a, world a world and people and inhabit the world and have it. opinions about it. Yeah. So you're making a statement about people and how they relate to people. That's yeah, even if you don't mean to make politics. it. Yeah, even if you don't mean to make it political, it can be yeah. political. Yeah, you might not like accent- right or left or blue or red, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. It's more about just how you navigate that space or like how people will respond to something you think is good or justice justified. Right. Um, that's, that's stories are is, moral but, tales. That's just what they are, you know. That's so. th- there's some exceptions, but those are usually films without thesis, you right. know. Uh, and that's fine, but usually that's like a tone poem or something. Yeah. Even like even like assassination of Jesse James by Cow- Robert Ford can't get away from statements about like, well, this guy was a coward, <laughs> you know. Like, yeah, that is a state a political statement. Uh, in any case. I think we've done it. I think oh, we've, we've done it. We've done Wall Street, and I really do feel like we're getting close. Like I'm starting to, I'm starting to see, and when I close my eyes, the vision board of like 
like six to eight nodes yeah that are connected and it's fucking that's the dad movie yeah you know like it's the dad movie will have like you can pick like three of them you can pick them all and they all seem to be true but you can pick three of them and like every dad movie has that in spades and if it doesn't it's not a really a dad movie. Right. I feel I like think, we're getting close. Yeah, there's no denying that we're inside dads and we're getting close to completion. I yeah. I, I completely agree with that. Yep. Yeah. And that is why we did this podcast. All for all for Dave to say what he just said. Exactly. This is all leading up to that moment. So I guess we're done. Actually, no, we're not done. In fact, next next month. Uh, we're going to cover a horror film, as you alluded to. And I yes. think if you want to preemptively watch it um, in a month, we're going to cover uh, Harrison Ford, who is yet to be in our shit. No, Fugitive. Uh, oh, no, that's not true. We did The Fugitive. My bad. Uh, but older Harrison Ford. We're going to cover What Lies Beneath. <laughs> Hell yeah, we are. Hell yeah, dude. It's a total dad horror movie. It is. And you might not notice it at first because it's from the perspective of a mom. But that is a dad horror film through and through. And we're, and we're gonna explain to you so good why that's true. Hell yeah. Because we've talked about it, man. We we're so excited. we I'm just so excited to be here. Me Dave, too. It's good to be inside a dad with you. Yeah, I agree. Do you want to plug anything? Ah, gamefully unemployed. Google it. It's a podcast network. Done. Plug is done. I'm so sick of plugs. Plug it in, plug it out, baby. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I got nothing else, you know. Uh, we'll see you in a month with this particular show. Yeah. You know what it is, patreon.com slash smallbeans. There's a bunch of really good shows. $5 a month, you get shows that both of our networks do, like uh, Star Trek The Next Futurama and Spielboys. Uh, yeah. That's correct. And then there's a bunch of other shows that are free. That's correct. I don't know. Fuck it. So go do that. Mm -hmm. Put them on into your your sound peepers. Goodbye.